Part two, human capabilities are enhanced by digitally enabled collaboration. Think of when you're stuck with a problem and you realize now that you're part of the global network, how much you can get answers to that. Not by asking the computer to do some processing, but by asking other people, right? Um, David Pogue has this great, David Pogue is a, was a, a columnist for the New York Times, and he had this famous thing where live with the reporter, with another reporter who's being interviewed by a reporter, they said, um, he said, let me ask my, he said, they asked him a question he didn't know the answer to. And he said, let me ask my Twitter friend. So he went, he tweeted, does anybody know the answer, blah, blah, blah. And within, while this conversation was still happening, the answers was, were coming back from his friends of the answer to this. You know, how on this camera can you do some feature? And he then went back to talk to the reporter. And before he was done with that sentence, answers were flowing in. Think about that. It's unbelievable. So think about the kind of the fact that we're all one global connected community, what that means for how we have human um, capabilities uh, moving forward. There's a movie uh, picture I show here called Connected. Tiffany Schlein, who was the uh, leader of the Webby Awards, she's a film producer. And she made a film, a, a full-length film, called Connected. And what it talks about is the excitement. And by the way, I encourage you to, to click on the link to see this, to see the trailer for the film. And you can even buy it and watch it on your web, on the web. She talks about the excitement when, when everyone becomes connected, how we kind of exist as one thinking brain where if there's a problem that someone has, we can all be working together to try to solve that together in a way that was never done before. And right now, we're not really all connected. The 7 billion people in the world are all not connected, but there are many initiatives to bring them all online. And once they are, you're going to have perspectives, diverse perspectives, artistic perspectives, scientific perspectives that you've never had now that you have everyone be able to contribute to the same idea. There's also a lot of chaos, Tower of Babel kind of a situation, but it's really exciting when everyone's connected. So, Internet and the web have changed many areas. You know that the internet and the web have transformed and disrupted a ton of industries. Uh, E-commerce, Amazon, uh, healthcare, digital records, and what it means to now be, be travel for spring break, say, a thousand miles away from home, you get sick, really sick, and quickly your digital records are sent over and the doctor locally can be looking at your records and not give you the shot that would have conflicted with your, your, your uh, allergies to it or something. That is incredible. Um, Health, that's healthcare. Access to information and entertainment. You all know that entertainment information goes with you now. You can carry it anywhere you want. You can be in some small village in the other part of the world and pull up Netflix and pull up your videos and pull up your cloud storage and look at your stuff. It's just incredible what that's meant for us. Especially online learning. We'll talk about online learning a little bit later, but online learning is amazing. With Khan Academy, with edX, with many online service providers, it's incredible. You can have learning anytime, anywhere. It's really amazing. Okay? They're, they're moving towards a, a model where you'll cache it locally. Cache means you have a local copy. So that if you're ever on the, on the plane, you can still do your learning, even though you're not directly connected to it. It's also, think about this, impacted productivity, positively and negatively, in many errors. Obviously, productivity is incredible, right? All of a sudden, I can get an answer to something by checking the web, asking friends instantly. But think about your productivity negatively. I show a picture of a young woman who is reading a comic, reading something, maybe that's required for her, for her class, and she pulls up her phone. Is she using her phone positively? Is she asking a question? Is she doing a search on a word she doesn't know? Or this, or oh, when was that person born? She's looking it up instantly. So that's a positive side. Or is she deciding, I need, some, I need my Angry Bird fix, and she's not getting her, hungry, not getting her, her, her work done, okay? So positively, negatively, obviously factors into this. We, the internet and the web haven't been the, the beginning of this. People were playing Minesweeper and dropping hours in Minesweeper before the internet and the web were happening. And they were also doing this before computers. They were you know, going back to reading their comic book instead of their homework they were supposed to do. So forever we've had things impacting our productivity, but it kind of, it's a little bit amplified when you have the ability to be uh, kind of addicted to Facebook and you can't get away from Facebook or other social sites or video games or whatever outside of some certain time limit. So search tools are really powerful and they're predictors thinking, oh, this is the same family of like how computing has changed society. Look at the search tools. So there's been an entirely, you see the link here to Google Trends, and there was a paper in Science Magazine, I believe, about, from the Google folks who said, you know, Google Trends are a great predictor, predictor of the flu. And it went viral. They're like, wow, it's amazing. Google Trends, this is big data. And this is part of the hubris of the big data folks. It turns out that it actually didn't predict it so well. Okay, they said, oh, big data can solve anything. It didn't. And part of the problem with it not being a great predictor is exactly what I'm showing you here, which is, 
they instituted a autocomplete feature. And many of us like that. Many of us like this. We say, do I have, and it'll tell you all the things that people, people have. And look at this. They have, do I have flash? I don't know what that means to have flash, but do I have the flu? Do I have flat feet? Do I have fleas? All right, so there's some problems with people who have some things they want to get, get them fixed. Because flu is so easy to choose, often people choosing do I have flu when they didn't mean to choose do I have flu. They meant to say do I have fl fl fluctuations and they en hit enter and now it credits as do I have flu. So Google's thinking somebody has flu in that location. Turns out that because autocomplete was trying to hand it to them, the numbers were inflated. Okay? So there was a counter to say that the Google trends weren't as good as they were and again that was part of the, a big hit to big data. Like this is the first time big data actually had overemphasized how successful it was when it actually wasn't as good as it was. Hardware support, I'll close this out with the last slide. So hardware support is really amazing. You bring in hardware aspects to the web and, and interconnected things and you get unbelievable things. So we know that the desktop to the, the shift the transformation shift, we call it a sea change, from the desktop model of computing to a mobile always on is unbelievable and transformative. Um, just to date this video, they just released the Apple Watch, and now the fact that you can have that so easy to get to is a really big deal. So you all are taking it for granted that you always have this, but it's a big deal for me who never had you know, a GPS in my hand. I never lost. I never can't connect with somebody. I never can get lost. You know, call emergency if something ever went wrong because I have it with me. So that's really transformative. GPS, we know how transformative GPS has been for geolocating things, for finding folks. You have the story in Blown to Bits where um, the triangulation of the woman who, uh, whose car went off the, the, car went off the ravine um, was found by the cell phone, but that was probably pre-GPS, but GPS could allow somebody to try to figure out where they are. Oh, here's her coordinates. Let me go try to find her in the woods, because I know her coordinates. Let's all have a search team and use the GPS coordinates to find them. Otherwise, it's like make a right at the shell station, make a left at the big tree. No, no way. GPS allows us all to converge. That'd be great. Uh, so it has changed how humans travel, navigate, and find information. That's obvious. Most of us use that. Sensor networks, you may not know what those are. So sensor networks are networks of nodes, and those nodes can sense anything. So there's a picture here. There's a picture of a sensor network, which often, by the way, the initial sensor networks were funded and were really excited by the military, who could, if they wanted to secure an area, make sure the bad guys didn't come in the middle of the night and kind of sneak up and crawl in the sand and kind of do bad things once they got into the, into the camp, they would sprinkle and spray the field or drop from a plane these sensor networks, which, like a home security device, could sense movement, could sense heat, could sense... You know, if there's a car driving by, it would move and shake and catch that. Um, so they could basically verify that if you sprinkle, imagine spraying a sensor network all around my camp, and it says, nope, I'm registering that I'm alive. I mean, the sensor network is saying, we're awake, and there's no movement here, all quiet on the western front, and eastern front, and northern and southern front. Get that? There's a western front. All right. Uh, so it would say, nobody's here. Okay, so you can sleep well because I've got you covered. And I will let you know if someone, if I sense some movement or something. That's amazing. So they were really excited about these sensor networks. But the evolution of sensor networks, a lot of the bell work, had work, that early seminal work was done at Berkeley in both the hardware and the software. Mobile Tiny OS was the operating system developed at Berkeley, and a lot of the uh, smart dust was done at Berkeley. And the idea was you put sensors the size of a, of a grain, and you mix it in paint, and you spray it on the wall, and you paint the walls with this. And now, Rather than having one fire uh, smoke detector, it's a smoke detector in the paint. And so there's a small fire in the corner. Rather than wait till the fire gets to the top of a huge room, and by that time the fire is too out of control, the paint by the small fire senses smoke, senses chemicals, senses heat, and says, eh, eh, and all of a sudden the fire goes off, you know, the, the alarm goes off much, much earlier than having one sensor at the top of the building. It's a big deal. You could have sensors that detect this movement, that, that turn the lights off in your room. They have that already. But sensors are really exciting. So being able to spray sensors around and have them sense anything. And the next generation of sensors are that you can send signals to the sensors. So imagine there's sensors during the day, but at night I can send LED signals, and each one of them can be a light source and make some picture or something. So that's really cool. Turn, turn yourselves off because I don't need to test something at night. Pretty cool stuff. So you can, it's bi-directional in terms of the sensor networks. Smart grids, smart buildings, and smart transportation are changing and facilitating human capabilities. The idea is that if you add AI to things, to buildings, who can now sense that there's nobody in the building and shut themselves down and power down if you want. That's amazing. Um, you can have smart cars that take people 
around that who previously couldn't be taken around, like a grandparent who can't drive anymore, or a blind person. They can now get in a car and be taken somewhere. It's unbelievable across town where normally they wouldn't have that ability. So that's really exciting. And finally, computing can, on that same topic, compu computing contributes to many assistive technologies that enhance human capability. And I show a beautiful picture here of someone um, who's in a wheelchair and has no movement at all except a little bit of the head, and they're able to vote. How are they able to vote? Because they, they bring their wheelchair up, and there's a touch screen, and they have a head dauber, a kind of a head device, and they move their head, and they're touching on a touch screen and voting and participating in the democratic process. Even though they really can only move their head a little bit, they can actually vote and confirm that what they vote was right and all set. Incredible. So these assistive technologies are allowing people to walk who couldn't walk with exoskeletons, to have movement, to have abilities. He even hearing aids count as assistive technology. So it's very exciting. And almost all of that have, at the, at the core of them, some computing. Okay? So in summary, computing has transformed the world. Computing has enabled us humans to go places we never have and, and bring folks who weren't there up to the level of other folks who are there. It's an exciting time. All right? More later. <laughs>